of the MPP Delegates Conference, uh, we're speaking to all the presidential hopefuls of the MPP. And interestingly, the first person on the ballot is my first guest. I want to welcome onto the show Dr. Kofi Kunedu Apreko. Thank you, sir, for your time. I appreciate the opportunity mm. to be with you. And thank you for allowing us in your beautiful home. I wanted you to come here so we build relationships. <laughs> <laughs> so we know each other mm. where we live. Sure. Uh, so you were Minister integration and NEPAD. Uh, so I guess it will be good for us to start off, first of all, with the measures uh, that government has put in place so that Ebola does not get into our country. So we're banning international conferences for the next three months. Uh, that's according to the foreign minister. Is this something that you would have recommended if you were in government today? Well, they have more facts than I do now. You know, if you're in government, you have all kinds of sources. You have intelligence, you have international information available to you. But I think the Ebola situation is serious enough for government to take important measures. Do, let's sit in where I am now, I feel very comfortable that they should put restrictions on movements of particularly countries that are going through that epidemic in, in their movement to our country. So mm -hmm. I have no difficulty with that. In the final analysis, governments are there to protect their citizens. Citizen interest is overriding, and any time the citizens of this country's lives are in danger, it is the responsibility of government to take whatever measures they have available to them to secure the lives of their people. Mm -hmm. And I think this may be an appropriate time for them to act as they have acted. Should people still be traveling to, to Sierra Leone, Guinea? And we haven't been mentioning Nigeria much, but the disease is in Nigeria as well. Well, Nigeria's one is not so much, uh, it's not as much, the level, at uh, the level that we have it, it hasn't spread as quickly as it has spread in uh, Liberia in particular. And if you've been following the news, Liberia, the government itself, has set up restrictions on movement mm. into the capital. Those living in the rural areas now have to go through difficult processes to enter the capital. And I think it's appropriate. We do not have the cure or the measures that will stop it. So what we have to do is to prevent those that are infected from infecting the rest of us. And therefore, the restrictions they are put up in their own country in respect of people moving to the capital, I consider them very appropriate. Mm. Let's deal with those that have been infected, isolate them from those that have not been infected, and, and find ways to deal with those that have been affected in terms of treatment, mm. rather than spread it all over. The unfortunate for all of us, we do not have adequate resources. We are very fragile. Our economies are fragile. Our health, health public health systems are fragile. So the least you can do is prevention mm. and, 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 and secure those that have not been infected from getting infected. One of the other issues that, that came up uh, during the Foreign Affairs Minister's press conference was the fact that there are still some Ghanaians in Tripoli. Uh, our foreign mission in Tripoli is no more there. I mean, their lives were at risk as well. Should we risk everything to go and secure them? I mean, should we spend so much money going to take them from Libya. You've been there before. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the life of every Ghanaian is important. There's no life that is not dear to somebody. If it's not important to you, it's because you don't know the person. They have children, they have family, they have people who care about them. And government has a responsibility to protect the lives and property of every Ghanaian, mm. even if they, when they have made a mistake. But I think the word should go out strongly to Ghanaians travel, traveling into these difficult areas. It's not too long ago, many of them, and in fact I know some of them, I've spoken to some of them, many of them were there during the uprising against Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, the late uh, former heads of state. And they went through very difficult times themselves protected, saved, and, and brought back to Ghana. And I think people should learn lessons out of it. But this is not the time to be criticizing anybody for even the mistake that they may have made. But it is time to be conscious of, of their own self-responsibility and to avoid places like that. But for now, government must do what they can to secure their lives. Mm. Um, what is also topical in the country today is our economy. Is it going to get any better from where you sit? 
Well, nothing happens by chance. Economies don't improve on their own. It improves when people have taken the appropriate measures. We've been talking about the measures that ought to have been put in place for a very long time. Now we're going to We were IMF? so defiant, so defiant, so insensitive. Somehow we thought that things work out on their own. Nothing works by chance. And we have to understand, when you overspend, you bear the, the, the risk of all the microeconomic instability variables that we have seen. Difficult exchange rates, unaffordable, making private sector uncompetitive. You live in Ghana, you borrow at 26% interest rate. You are competing with a country, most advanced countries like United States, the Europeans, interest rates are hovering around 2-3%. On what basis are you going to be able to compete? Why you're not producing goods that are of the quality that they produce, and yet you have to price your goods so high because of the cost of production? When you are not able, then we create all the instabilities that we have, all the exchange rate difficulties we are going through, all the difficult problems with our external reserves, all the difficulties with our account. All of these things did not happen overnight. They have been accumulating since 2009. And the chicken, as Americans we say, have come home to roost. So we are seeing it. Government seems to me feel a sense of helplessness. They don't seem to have a clue of how to fix the economy. Isn't that why they've gone to the IMF? Well, that is the, the very manifest. If you know how to do solve your problems, you don't go and invite somebody to help you come and solve it. But the funny thing is that it's the lack of discipline. What is it, the, what is it that uh, IMF is going to do that we don't know already? I can give you prescription of exactly what they're going to do because it's happened before. We've been working with them for a long time. They said that cut down your borrowing cut the waste, reduce government expenditures, trim public sector employment. I can list these on and on and on. We know all of this. The only thing that is missing is effective, competent leadership to do that. The discipline to do that, that is what we lack. And what the IMF is going to do is tell us, oh, you little boy, sit here. If you get up, I'll punish you. Just like we were doing Maybe when we were in school. Maybe that's what we need because, I mean, left to us alone, but Nobody that's what I said. If you don't do the that's right exactly thing. what I said. We know what we should have done. We have not done it. We have invited somebody to supervise us to maybe do that's what we what know. Maybe that's what we need, a supervisor. But, oh, yeah. Maybe that's what it's needed. But it's, it's, it's tragic that we've been through the processes, that we know better, and yet we do not have the political will, the strength of leadership to do it such that we have to bring somebody to tell us. It's embarrassing. And I think NDC has successfully taken us back two decades, more than two decades, where we were before. Just please review where we were about 20, 25 years ago, and you'll be surprised that having risen as far as we did, having made the giant steps that we took, the sacrifices people made to go through HIPIC and then emerging out of HIPIC, and extensive international confidence in our economy, the sense of optimism among our own people, mm. the sense that Ghana mm. can succeed within West Africa, within Africa, and overnight, everything tumbles down. If the rate of increases, this year alone is depreciated by over 40%, please, 40%, no matter how, wherever you were, if you suffer that significant decline, you'll be where we are. And it didn't happen by chance. You are not telling me there are extraordinary circumstances. Go and look at government expenditure during the election. The election year, 2012, 20, uh, sorry, 20, 2010 and 2011. And it will give you a clear sense of why we are where we are now. People seem to believe you can get away with anything. So and we are not going to get away with anything. What you put in is what you're going to get. So and the, that's the, what we are the, getting the today. The NPP saw this coming. We didn't see it coming. We were so confident that we were going to win the next election. And then we will continue with the pragmatic policies that we had embarked on it. Credible policies that won the confidence of the international com com community, that won the confidence of Ghanaians abroad who invested so much in this economy. That won the confidence of our local entrepreneurs who were defiant of even opportunity to go elsewhere and stayed here. They look at the leadership. 
they look at the practical policies that we were engaging not just the capitalistic policies even the social intervention policies that send a signal that this is a government that was comprehensive in its approach to dealing with our problem that's how you win international confidence mm. so now we know our problem we say our problem is leadership indeed uh, what is making news uh, today really is the fact that uh, Mensa Otebel, the head pastor of the ICGC, has also uh, talked about leadership. The fact that the boat is sinking and leadership is failing. What can we do? What should we do? I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of my young and productive years in the United States. Let me tell you, this is just to give you a perspective of how, why I'm going to say why I'm, what I'm going to say right now. When I left Ghana, I was 17 years old, just out of Form 5. Went and continued my high school in the United States. Finished high school, did a bachelor's, master's, PhD, taught for 11 years. I appeared three universities, worked for the UN in Croatia, worked for the UN in South Africa, came back and came back to Ghana as an adult. I had the opportunity to go to school there and I had the opportunity to teach students. I had the opportunity to work within the system, both U.S. and internationally. My sense of what is wrong with us as Africans, Africans, and I felt very strongly, and I've said so many, many times, the difference between us and them is not the level of intelligence because I've been in classroom with them, competed with them, and many Ghanaians, I'm not an exceptional, mm. many other Ghanaians have had the opportunity to compete at the highest level, and they have been very successful. So they are not smarter than we are. Number two, we, are, we have more resources, natural human resources, than most of the countries that have been successful. What I found link missing in the equation is effective, visionary, selfless, bold, strong leadership that can get things done. Leadership that is committed to achieving something that they believe in the final analysis will be their legacy. We don't have that. Everybody is in this business for something. Yes, obviously, everybody has to be in business for something. But you measure the magnitude of it, and there's no sacrifice. We do things that are not necessarily in the interest of our country, but in our own self-interest. And I'm even go willing to say, on both political levels, that the sense of nation has not taken the pride of place in our politics. And somebody was just asking, if you were asked to go and work with the NDC, would you do that? Every Ghanaian must be willing to work in any government that will advance the interest of the people. Because in the final analysis, we are all educated by Ghanaians. God has blessed us with experience, with wisdom. And the essence of all of this is to make a contribution. So I don't particularly have difficulty working for NDC or any other political party. But we have to create the environment that allows people to feel comfortable and to feel confident that even given the opportunity, they will be allowed to work and achieve results. Mm. We created a political environment that is so contentious. Our country is so polarized that as if all that matters in Ghana is politics. And yet that's not what matters. Elsewhere in the world, they take three, four months to do an election. When a government is elected, people give them space to do what the people who gave the mandate to do. And when it's election time, we come and compete. In our country, the day you are elected to the day of the next election, you have no peace, you have no way to do anything without it being interpreted politically. And I'm saying this because it bothers me, not just because it's now it's all, you know, the gun is turned on NDC. It cannot be the case that we play politics four years. Every four years, any government that comes, there's no honeymoon. Can it Why? ever change? It can change because human beings make change. Nothing change on its own. Which if party will change it then? Me, Kofi Apreku, I'll change that environment. It doesn't have to be a political party. It can be an individual who's sensitive and cares and believe it is a problem. First, we have to recognize that it's a problem. 
Because until you recognize that it's a problem, you can't even begin to look at the solution. You see, I've heard that uh, recently too often. We have to recognize that, first of all, we have a problem. How does that recognition come about? What do you want to see before you know that we've accepted that we have a problem? When you are <coughs> to accept a problem, to accept a problem, one is to confess that I have a problem that I need to find solution. Invite people that you believe can make a contribution to solving the problem. That's the first step. Because none of us, none, none, me inclusive, you inclusive, have absolute monopoly on any knowledge or any measures to deal with anything. Okay. I have some, you have some, everybody have, has some. Mm -hmm. And if we are committed to a common cause, and the common cause is Ghana, that this country must rise, that we have everything we need to have to advance ourselves. The leadership, effective leadership that I'm seeing is not the dictatorial leadership, but inspiring leadership. Leadership that people can look at and say, yes, I will go beyond myself because of the leadership that I see in you. I am willing to do something that otherwise I will not do. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of leadership that we're talking about. So Dr. Farko, you can make the change from where you said. Why do you so badly want to be president? Oh, everybody can make some change. They say brighten the corner where you are. It's a step. But if you make an e if you are so determined to make an impact, the best platform is the political uh, position, particularly the presidency. You can be a minister. You can have all the beautiful ideas. We can go to cabinet, and I've been there before, and we will argue. I have presented papers, and I'm not here to criticize anybody. Recently, when we had the Minister of Trade Forum, I was talking about two initiatives that I had taken that went to Parliament, that Parliament approved, but were not implemented. One, protection of the domestic industry. I had proposed extensive tariff on eggs, on rice, I mean, poultry, mm. rice, textiles, about five selected products that I believe we had the opportunity, we had comparative advantage, or at least we can produce them in our country. There were interventions from other sectors. We were not able to do it. This domestic content policy that I, I suggested, I think I'm not really trying to take credit for anything, but I think I made that point first in this country. Because in the US, in the 1980s, the Japanese had taken over the automobile industry, and Americans could not compete. All the Japanese firms were moving into the United States. I live in Ohio, the, the automobile belt, where we produce more automobiles between Michigan, Ohio. We produce most of the automobiles in the US. So it was a concern. They push for a legislation in the US that says that no car can be marketed in the U.S. without, a, I think, 15 or 20 percent of the inputs coming from the United States. No Japanese or any company. That was the first time all these companies moved into the U.S. What was it about? We're patronizing these products. Our economy is sinking. Our people can't get jobs. We are producing your cars in your country and you're shipping it here and we are spending our money buying it and you're taking the money back. That was the beginning of my conception of a domestic content bill, that a car sold in the U.S. must have at least 15, 20 percent of the inputs purchased from the UN, U.S. So they move in there. So when I came to Ghana, I made this proposal that there are specific sectors, and India had already implemented a similar proposal. I went to Parliament. I prepared domestic con content bill. I consulted with AGI. Um, I'm forgetting the chairperson, the one who was recently involved with the uh, um, President Mahama's economic management team, the chairperson, I'm forgetting, the UAC man. I work Ishmael. Ishmael Yamsen? Yamsen. He's alive. He can tell you the work we did on this. I went with him, worked with AGI to come out with a bill. Then I thought it was necessary, but now it's even more necessary. We become economy just in buying goods from overseas. Those are issues that we have to address. So there are issues that all of us can make a contribution to solving. Mm -hmm. But we can't pretend that everything is okay. But you see, Dr. Preku, uh, 
before you can be president of Ghana, you have to be leader of your own party. Yes. And they didn't give you the mandates uh, the last time. Why? I mean, I don't know if it's assurances that you've received, but why do you think they will give you that mandate now? Only God knows who will be giving the mandate. I happen to believe in God, but I also have a vision. And your vision can only be tested out. People, you have the responsibility to explain what it is that you want to do. And if you're a good leader, get people to follow you. Can you That's what I intend to do. Can you work, for instance, with uh, Nanado Alan Shamateng? Why Nanado and Alan Shema? They are not the only people in the race. People say that they are the two uh, leading members in the race. That's what those people talking think. The people who are going to vote, they will speak. Yeah, Can absolutely. any MPP person work with whoever is selected? All of you are contributing to the divisions within our party. Nobody is a spokesperson for us. You don't have a vote. Many of the people don't have votes. Oh. And yet they pretend. Yeah. You, you go and put in your newspaper who your conception of the leading candidates are. The people who make the decision will make the decision. And when they make that decision, what will happen is that everybody should rally around whoever is selected. Okay, so this is the Friday, 15th, August 2014 Absolutely. edition of the Daily yes. uh, Guide mm -hmm. newspaper. And in it, uh, this I is. I don't care what H7. Daily Guide says because we know group, where it stands. There's a group that is uh, calling, for instance, uh, it says a group that calls itself Crusaders for Change, uh, le led by a couple of people, uh, have dropped a hint about the ploy to sabotage the upcoming Congress. In a statement that they've issued, I am not saying it. This is in a this is a, a newspaper well, report. It will be unfortunate. It will be unfortunate for anybody to plot to stop the conference. Is it the first part or the second? We have two camp elections that are taking place. One is just about what 15 days to the time. The other one, some proposals have been made for 18 of October. I'm not comfortable with that 18 of October, but I'm not in any way associated with any measures i think you, you're not comfortable with the 18th of october dates date. what date is suitable for you i think the constitution would have put us at december 6th or 7th six clear months after nominations are open that is very clear constitutional provision and i'm willing to live with that but i'm also an optimist uh, realistic that uh, we should find ways to accommodate each other some have proposed 18. I proposed or I supported the 15th of November, which was originally the date, second option that was presented by the national executive. I think that would be a compromise that everybody ought to live with. 18 of October is too close. That is just for the two days first conference. And the f we have 275 constituencies in this country. If you assume that a candidate can do four constituencies a day and work seven days a, a week, he will require 68 days, 68 days to make a tour of the country. And that is just once. Many of us would like a second opportunity to go around, second opportunity to listen to what others have said to the delegates and see if there are ways to make changes or to project a particular line or particular policy. Mm. That's always to be expected. You can't just go once and assume that your message has been taken or been bought by everybody. Mm. So if we can't have December 6th, but we can have November, that will give us a fighting chance. I think it's necessary. We are not enemies in this party. So and you we say there are no divisions in, in the party? Oh, there are. I will never say up? that. I say we are not enemies. We can compete, but we are not enemies. That's, that's what I said. But, but the point is that we should be able to behave and act in ways that will make it easier for all of us to get together mm. than for all of us to be fighting against one that emerges victorious because only mm. one can win. You know, some people have said that with the challenges that the country is facing now, it would really be good if all of you decided to support just one candidate so that from the very beginning, you will have Ghanaians if they 
to you, you know, supporting you from the very beginning instead of going through this race. Remember that the seven of you are going, they will crop two out, and then the five of you would go for this other date that, you know, people are speculating it will be shifted and that kind of thing before we go for the general elections in 2016. Wouldn't it be good if we had only one candidate? It would be excellent. From this beginning? It would be excellent if they have Kofi Kunodu Apreku as the candidate. I have no difficulty with that. How about the person um, who emerged the winner the last time? I don't want to talk about anybody who emerged the winner the last time. It would be easy to market him since he's That's known. your view. There are other views out there. So you're not, you're not, I mean, you're in it. You're not ready to back down. It's obvious. So, Dr. Preku, I'm just wondering how you are funding, uh, going around, talking to delegates and asking them to vote for you. It's a very difficult time to be involved in a campaign. You know, the difficulties within the economy. Usually, you expect people to help finance your campaign. But the people who usually would have financed you are going through very serious difficulties of their own. Mm. So it, make it, it makes it very difficult to raise funding. People that you expected to have given you maybe a thousand, they'll give you 200, 500. And so it's been difficult. We have tried to do the best we can. We have been very modest in our expenditure. Maybe this is all important for us to know the value of maximizing your resources and cutting the waste and maybe learning more to manage your country mm -hmm. resources the hell that people are going through in this country today is perhaps unprecedented and maybe anybody selected will learn that it is the cumulative decisions that we have made wrong decisions that we have made that have brought us here mm -hmm. and we all will learn about that as we go through in our own personal lives the challenges we face vis-a-vis -vis the challenges we face in, in this country, I think is, is good for all of us so to learn and local, do better. So local people give you funding? Obviously. Our political process, our political laws will not even allow you to accept funding from overseas. So resources for campaign should be mobilized from within the country. Okay, I'm interested in knowing how uh, an individual would do that. Uh, do you organize a ball, for instance, to get people to attend Some do. Donate. I have not made personal contact with individuals to support the campaign, but okay. I haven't organized a fundraising. Do you event. promise them anything when they give I you money? I promise them good governance. Good governance. Not positions when, I, when no, you win power. When I, when I, oh, positions when you win power, not really, because most of the positions are coming. I have not raised one CD from any MP. I have not asked any MP to make a contribution to me, and I have not received any on their own either so and most of the position are supposed to majority of your ministers must come from parliament so if you were going to be raising money based on that type of promises the best place to have been is parliament i've not spoken to one parliamentarian and unfortunately not one has made their own decision to bring me anything mm. but whatever be the case the people i've spoken to i've appealed to them in their self-interest i've spoken to business people and I've, I've tried to impress on them the need to have somebody who can provide an alternative management to the way we are managing our economy today. And I bring to bear my own experience, my training, my background as a basis to convince them. What I did as trade minister, I worked very close with the business community. And I'm impressing on them that if they were to support me, uh, they will have better days, the golden mm. era of business will come back to them. Exactly. The delegates, you have a responsibility to yourself, to your party, and to your country to select the very best person amongst us to lead our party. Our party has gone through some very difficult times. We worked so hard to win power in 2000. We won six regions out of 10. Impressive results across the country. We give people hope and we manage our affairs as best as we could. All of us, we were hopeful that we could even continue to offer the best governance, the best governance that our country has received. Better management of the economy, looking into the future and providing opportunity for the, the, the poor and the frail and the weak. We did all that. Unfortunately, we lost the last two elections. It is time to go back and learn one, why we lost these elections? Why has 
our fortunes or have our fortunes decline in strong streets regions such as Brown Hafu in central region, western region, and the greater Accra region. What, what measures, measures are we putting in place to ensure that we can recapture Brown Hafu? We can recapture the lost regions. What credentials, what experience, what qualities do we have to one manage the economy if we win the next election? What are we going to do as a party to unite the, 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 the various so-called fashions within our party to build a political machinery that can deliver victory and once we win also deliver prosperity to our people? I have been privileged with my rural background to understand the difficulties the average Ghanaian goes through, my own conception of what the problems are in our rural agricultural areas of the country. My exposure abroad, extensive international network, it's not just enough to be president. It's to be president that can deliver based on your experience, based on your contacts. When we came into office, the extensive contact that President Kofor and his minister had were decisive in generating the resources and the goodwill that our country enjoyed during that period and therefore catapulting us to the level that we got to. I will provide seamless leadership of extensive experience all over the world and I will intend to bring that to bear on this country and our development. I believe I have the requisite experience, the service the commitment, the loyalty, and a vision that can transform this country. One, we need to transform our party. We must engage in reforms that will reshape and reposition our party, make it more attractive to the floating voters, make it more attractive to those who otherwise would not even think of MPP. Some of those who believe we are uh, elitist, we have to go to their level. We have to work in the Zungus. We have to work to bring back first, as the first point of call, bring Hafu back into the fold and measures to bring the rest. These are the issues that have agitated my mind. It is not possible for us to continue to have declining bulls in Ashanti and the Eastern region and all the other regions and believe that we can march into a victory. It cannot be the case. Nothing will happen by chance. If we win the next election, it will be based on effective work that we have done to re-engineer our party, rebrand our party, refocus our party, serious work to identify why we have lost elections, why we have lost significant majority of votes in the four regions that we have lost. These are the things that have occupied my mind. I've thought through very carefully the measures that we need to put in place to unite our party, measures that we need to put in place to win back the regions that we have lost, measures that we have to put in place to energize the base of our party and to give confidence to our grassroots people to be able to vote for us. I believe I have the qualities that will enable me to succeed. I invite you to join me. We have some work to do in building this country. We have some work to do in building our party. Now, provide effective, enlightened leadership. Leadership that will go beyond self-interest and put the national interest at the front, forefront of every decision that I make that will advance the course of this country. This that is the challenge that I see ahead of us. This is the dream that I have for this country. So you heard former MP of Insonop, former Minister of Regional Integration and NEPAD, and also former Trades Minister, Dr. Kofi Kunedu Apreko. Until next time when we bring you another candidate aspiring, uh, we'll see you here again next time.